right. Uh, one announcement we forgot is we should be good to go on breakfast next Sunday, right? Good to go? All right, good. July 4th, easy day to remember, first Sunday of the month, breakfast, patriotic breakfast, patriotic Lord's Supper. Uh, because we are free in this country, uh, we often say that America was founded as a Christian nation. There are a couple of ways in which that is actually not technically true. Now, when I went to England as a student, um, they are able to say they are a Christian nation because the official English church, it, the English church is the official church. And they can teach Bible stories in school. Doesn't matter how many Muslims immigrate to England or the fact that less than 6% of the population actually attends any church services. It's just history to them. So they teach Bible stories and, and church history and stuff like that in a government run public school. But we specifically denied the opportunity to have an official church in America because we didn't want one church to rule over the other. So in that sense, we are not a Christian nation. In the other sense, we're Baptist and only people can get saved, not nations. Okay. And so we are not a Christian nation. But if you do your research, you will find that the twin pillars of Western society, Christianity and Greco-Roman thought and legal processes, those built Western society. And we also draw a lot of our heritage from the enlightenment that was going on in philosophy at that time. And out of the, I believe it's out of the 55 signers of the Declaration of Independence, 53 of them had a seminary degree. Not that I would let all 53 of them preach from this pulpit, uh, because some of them were a little off in la-la land uh, based on their religious beliefs. And, uh, and so David Barton wants you to think that maybe every single founding father was a good Southern Baptist. That's not entirely true either. Uh, to say that everyone was a Christian except for Thomas Jefferson and Benjamin Franklin is like saying, oh, what was the thing I came up with the other day? It's like, uh, it's like everybody that works at Siegel and Schuster is saved except for Siegel and Schuster. You know, it's just kind of, we, we rely on those two a lot. They were technically deists who believed that, sure, some great God made the world, but then he left it to run its own course. And then as the Revolutionary War continued on, they, even the deists, like Benjamin Franklin, like Thomas Jefferson, began to see what they called the hand of providence throughout uh, protecting our nation, helping us win battles we should have lost. And so uh, our nation was definitely founded with many, many Christian principles. And the, uh, the separation of church and state was, something, was a phrase that Thomas Jefferson used in a letter to a bunch of Baptist ministers, of all people, who were scared that the government might decide to try to tell the churches what they could say and what they couldn't. And so that original line, that wall of separation between church and state, was not to assure all the secular humanists that those stupid Christians shouldn't bring their religion into the public square. It was originally used to reassure the Christians that the government was not going to interfere with the running of their churches. And so we do live in a nation where, where we are free to be Christians, we are free to exercise our religion in whatever way that we, not just the way that we see fit, but whatever we, way that we think God sees fit. And so as we approach the 4th of July, it's perfectly fine to, ha to celebrate our military. We may have some characters in government that have them do some shady things, but that doesn't mean we don't celebrate our military. We can celebrate our virtues and Christian freedoms and our American freedoms because they are compatible with each other. We can say the Pledge of Allegiance to the American flag at Vacation Bible School until we get taken over by communists, then we can throw that out. And, uh, and then uh, we can honor the fact that we are both citizens of heaven and citizens of the closest thing any nation has ever come to a utopia where everyone has an opportunity to feed themselves. That's what the United States of America is. I dare you to try living somewhere else. Uh, and there are some places that are very nice, but you are not as free in any of them as you are here. 
Uh, you would be amazed what you can be arrested for in Canada and Britain, as free as those places are. Uh, this morning, we are going to be in the book of Acts, where, ironically, we will be talking about a lack of freedom to worship as we see fit. Acts chapter 5. We had an excellent time at camp this week. Uh, as many of you know, I spent two weeks ago, Monday through Friday, at children's camp, and God moved. And lots of kids made decisions. Some of them claimed that they had been baptized before. They'd given their heart to Jesus maybe as much as four times before. But I, I asked the one kid who was not from our church, uh, you know, so you got baptized before. Did you pray to accept Jesus like we just did? Because I had about five or six boys right there. And I was the only one there to counsel with them because of other, some of them were uh, counseling with others. And and he said, oh, no, I've never done that before. And that's okay. I'm not even going to automatically blame his church because who knows when kids are paying attention. Amen? Right. When they don't look like they're paying attention, they can tell you every word that you've said. And when they're staring at you, they're thinking about what's on their snapper doodle chat thingy. And so uh, we... Was that not what it's called? Mom, she's having one of your laughing fits. All right. That I also have occasionally as well. Uh, but anyways, um, they did. Uh, and, and I'm hoping, and, and, and if anyone is here that made a decision at camp, it's perfectly acceptable to come forward to an invitation and tell the whole church. It's a little intimidating, but everyone will be so happy and excited for you. And they want to tell you congratulations, okay? So don't let, don't be intimidated. Everybody here loves you and cares about you. Uh, this past week was youth camp. Normally, we separate the middle schoolers and the high schoolers. And I think the high schoolers like it that way. I'm here to tell you as a leader, I like it this way, okay? You have a concentration of middle schoolers, and that only leads to problems, right? So uh, they're all mixed together this week. And, uh, and we had a good time. We played crazy games. Uh, we... We do this thing called slip and slide kickball on tarps with dish soapy water. It is very slippery. The bases are kiddie pools, and you and it does not hurt to land in the kiddie pool as much as you think it will. You just got to go for it. You got you just got to don't even slow down. Just jump, lift up your legs, get over the side of the kiddie pool, and just land. It's it's. I was amazed at how easy it was. It just looks scary, and and believe it or not. We have never had a broken bone playing this game. In, this, in the seven summers that I have done church camp, I don't know of any broken bones. But it looks like you're, there's definitely going to be broken bones today. Our nurse threatened to just be in his cabin waiting for word because he knew he couldn't watch it. Uh, but, but anyways, uh, the kids enjoy that kind of thing, lots of activity. But we preached about Jesus. We did the seven seas of history, uh, creation, corruption, Catastrophe, I got to preach on that one. Uh, confusion, such as at the Tower of Babel. Christ, the cross, and consummation. And, uh, every, and, and Thursday night, we gave an invitation, and there were several young people that needed to make a decision. I got to counsel with kids that had come from other churches. One girl wanted to ask questions for like an hour. She wanted to argue with me. And, and, and the only reason I was counseling a young lady, because we don't, we don't do that, the the other leader whom I respect and love dearly brought her to me saying, she's just arguing with me. And we both argued with her at that point. It finally dawned on me. She's arguing with us because she wants to believe, but she is struggling with it. So pray for her. Um, but it reminds me of the book of Acts. All of the excitement. And I want you today to think about your excitement for Jesus? Are you excited enough about what God has done to stand for what God has done in your life? Are you excited? It, it, does this mean so much to you that you're willing to risk things? Uh, and, and, and there might have been some confusion over some of the things I've said in the past. Um, and so I want to clarify that um, sometimes churches think they have hired a pastor in order to do everything because no one else has time to do it. 
Some pastors think that the church members need to be doing everything and all he has to do is preach on Sundays. I don't know many pastors who think that and last very long in the ministry, but it is similar to that dream that we kind of all have. What I want you to know is the pastor of a church, a spiritual leader, has one kind of ministry. That does not mean that you don't also have a ministry. And I know that this is an area where we have maybe not been as strong, because if you remember taking that survey several years ago that I had everybody take, one of the big things that no one felt like this church was doing was instructing the members on what their duties are as a member. So we're not going to expect you to do the pastoral things, but when someone that you love and you know from church is in the hospital, there's no need for you to feel like, well, Travis is going to visit them, and so that'll be okay. And that's all messed up right now with COVID, even still. But you also feel free to visit that member in the hospital. Somebody from your Sunday school class, you know, let's pretend that all the adults here are not in the same Sunday school class. Uh, but, but someone from your Sunday school class, someone that you feel a special kinship with, they would love to have a visit from their pastor and from you too. Uh, when it comes to witnessing to your friend that you have known for years, yes, call your pastor. Your pastor would love to sit down with that person and answer maybe the theological questions that you don't feel comfortable answering. But guess what? That friend of yours, that relative of yours is going to assume that, of course, the pastor loves to talk about this kind of stuff. And, of course, he loves Jesus. He gets paid by him. But you... When you love Jesus for free, and you care about them for free, and they've already known you for years, you can witness to them in a way that I never could and represent Jesus to them in a way that I never could. And so as time goes on, especially as we are talking about the book of Acts, I want us to learn how to be the church together. And yes, the pastor has a special role, but what? let's answer the question together. What role does the average church member, the average Christian, what are you supposed to do? You, I, I, want, I want you to learn from the book of Acts. This will be one of the things that you have the same Holy Spirit. You have the same Holy Spirit as your pastor does. You have the same Holy Spirit as these early church people do. You are empowered by the same God. It, there was a great minister who once said, attempt great things for God and expect great things from God. And I feel like that might be a weak area of this church and my ministry. I don't expect God to do great things. I felt in the past that maybe he left us hanging or something like that. But, but really, as the Lord worked with my heart, I began to see that there were times when I didn't take my concerns to the Lord. I didn't take the direction that this church needs to go to the Lord and say, Lord, what direction would you like for our church to do? What programs should we uh, spend our time on, put our energy into? What people should I be pouring into? Who is uh, the person to fulfill this next role that we need fulfilled? It's been very good for me to hang out with my camp leader friends for two weeks. It's, it's had a very good effect on me. Now, Last Sunday, we talked about Ananias and Sapphira. They lied to God. They probably didn't think they were lying to God. They thought they were lying to their church. But they lied to their church, and Peter says, you've lied to God. And God struck them dead. We serve a God who believes in real judgment. Our God still hates sin. In the Old Testament, he hated sin. He destroyed entire cities. He promised destruction upon the nation of Israel if they worshipped any other gods, and he delivered on that. There's a popular misconception in Christianity today that God changed his mind, and that's how we got the New Testament, and that is absolutely not the case. God still hates sin. God still has hell reserved for people who do not turn away from their sin, reserved for the devil and his fallen angels. And I even shared Tuesday night when I spoke on catastrophe, there's a verse in Revelations uh, that talks about how those who took the mark of the beast are tortured day and night with fire and brimstone in the presence of the holy angels and in the presence of the Lamb. 
And so God still cares about sin. God still hates sin. God still punishes sin. And there's no way out of it on our own. On our own. But that same God, and this is why we talk about a merciful God, because he is a merciful God. That same God said, I want to rescue my people. And he came in the form of Jesus, lived a perfect life that we could not live, died to pay for those sins. And when Jesus comes to live in our hearts, we get his righteousness. We get his righteousness. God didn't want to leave things the way that they were. God sent away, and he didn't want to just say, okay, I was wrong. Sin's okay. Come on into the kingdom. No, 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 no. He still hates sin. It still had to be paid for some way. And he paid for it, even though it was our sin, God paid for it at his own cost. At his own cost. Jesus came and died, suffered the horrible death that we were supposed to suffer so that we would not have to suffer it and died and paid the price so that I can go free so that you can go free so that all that call upon the name of the Lord will be saved the Jew and the Gentile this is the gospel that sent the apostles over the edge crazy turned their world upside down. Picture a Jerusalem, 100,000 people, a huge city at that time. And like Branson, it would swell seasonally to ridiculous levels of population as Jews and God-fearing Gentiles from all over the world came to be near the one true God at the one place that was approved for animal sacrifices there at the temple. And so imagine, since we live in a world of conspiracy theories and not being sure which conspiracy theory is the truth and which one is just a conspiracy theory, you know, who won the election, do masks really work, was the coronavirus started in a lab, is the CC, is the communist Chinese party behind all of it, is our government in cahoots with them, all of these theories out there, will bacon fat clog your arteries, that's my favorite, because I already know the answer to that one, uh, but, but, so we don't trust our authority figures, right? And along comes someone with something else, a different story it seems to fit the facts better. And so living in Jerusalem at this time, the government line is from the religious leaders, the theocracy, the, the religion led government, local government there in Jerusalem. And they had authority over all the synagogues throughout the or they were supposed to have authority throughout all the synagogues throughout the Roman Empire. Every Roman city having a significant Jewish population, having local synagogues. The official line was this Jesus claimed to be somebody, but we killed him and he's nothing. But if you knew the right people, you would hear a different story. If you happened to be there in the temple on the day that that man got healed from his, uh, from his lameness, from being crippled, you heard John and Peter preach on how this miracle was done in the name of Jesus, whom you crucified, but he rose from the dead. He was the one sent by God. He paid for our sins and believing you can have life in his name. And this little conspiracy theory saying that the uh, government elite had it all wrong, that they had rejected God when they rejected Jesus, but that you can have life in his name. Thousands of people were flocking to this. OK, they would have been banned on Facebook and Twitter, and they would have been censored, you know, you'd type on there, there'd be Peter preaching on the internet, and it would be covered with this thing that says, uh, lots of untrue statements, don't click on this, you know, nothing to see here. But it was true. We know it was true. We know it was true. So that's where we find our story today in Acts chapter 5, starting in verse 12. Now many signs and wonders were regularly done among the people by the hands of the apostles. And they were all together in Solomon's portico. None of the rest dared join them, but the people held them in high esteem. And more than ever, believers were added to the Lord, multitudes of both men and women, so that they even carried out the sick into the streets and laid them on cots and mats, that as Peter came by, at least his shadow might fall on some of them. The people also gathered from the towns around Jerusalem, bringing the sick and those afflicted with unclean spirits, and they were all healed. 
Um, I feel led to pray right now since we've read some of the scriptures. So let's go ahead and do that. Father, we lift up our hearing of your word today. And as I try to explain it, oh Lord, I pray that you would draw our attention to what you want us to hear today. Lord, I've definitely done this long enough to know that maybe what I thought was the main point is not the thing that some of our folks will take home with them and will change their lives the more they think about it. But we know that you know all things and you know our hearts and that though I am not always available, that you are. And so I pray that our folks would be asking you questions. Our folks would be wanting to turn every aspect of their lives over to you, that we would be caught up in the same furor that took hold of those early believers in Acts so that we would continue the book of Acts. In Jesus' name, amen. So this is crazy, right? Not officially sanctioned by the Sadducees and the Pharisees who are in charge over at the temple, but they are near the temple. They are a part of the temple complex at Solomon's portico. And if you just show up, you will see that people are getting healed. Now, I want to make an important point about the Holy Spirit, okay? When Jesus came to earth, the government had a big troublemaker on their hands, not just because he disagreed with them and could speak well, although that's a big part of it. People were amazed that Jesus taught, not as one uh, who had just simply studied the scriptures, but he taught with authority. So Jesus' teaching itself was pretty much a miracle within itself. Pe people's hearts burned. They knew they were hearing truth. But on top of that, Jesus is healing people. Jesus is casting out demons with simply one word. Everybody else set up a whole ceremony and there was rings of Solomon to put on the guy's chest and they had to shout things at him. And Jesus just shows up and the demons are obviously afraid of him. Who is this guy that demons are afraid of? Uh, and, and, the peop and they had a real troublemaker because they couldn't always... Is my microphone too loud, Ashley? Oh, okay. Okay. Um, people had to, um, th they had a real troublemaker on their hands because the crowds loved him. You can't just crucify somebody who healed your uncle, who healed your child, who cast out the demon of your, of your poor child. And now I want you to understand with the coming of the Holy Spirit, when it comes to your own personal ministry, those religious leaders now have a lot of Jesus's on their hands. Amen? Amen. The Holy Spirit means that Jesus ascended into heaven because could you imagine if Jesus had an office in Jerusalem and every time we wanted to know God's will, we had to call him? Would you ever get through to Jesus? No, you would not. It, the Catholic Church only rules part of the Christian world and, that, and the Pope is way too busy to talk to you, right? So, so if it was that kind of system... And if you were supposed to come to me for all of your spiritual growth as your spiritual leader, we would be in trouble, right? I'm just one man. And I and there's churches way bigger than ours. How is this going to run? God's solution is that God himself would come and live in our hearts. Come and live in our hearts. And I want you to understand that especially uh, in our theological uh, heritage as Baptists, we really, we really believe this, that you don't need a priest, you don't need a minister, you don't need anybody between you and God. We encourage you to pray and do your devotions every day because you can, because you can. You don't have to turn on a preacher on the radio or the TV Thank God we live in a world where everybody can have five or six Bibles on their shelf and never think a thing of it. Open that word and hear from God himself. And even if it was only the apostles who were doing miracles, they now had 12 Jesuses on their hands, just like gray hairs. You pull one out and two of them pop back up to replace it. They had killed one Jesus and 12 had jumped up to replace him. And more than that, I believe. I believe there was a lot more Christians doing miracles than just the 12 apostles. But anyways, verse 17, the story continues. Uh, the government is going to try to shut this down. Verse 17, but the high priest rose up, and all who were with him, that is the party of the Sadducees, and filled with jealousy, they arrested the apostles and put them in the public prison. That's that, right? 
But during the night, an angel of the Lord opened the prison doors and brought them out and said, Go and stand in the temple and speak to the people all the words of this life. And when they heard this, they entered the temple at daybreak and began to teach. Now when the high priest came and those who were with him, they called together the council and all the senate of the people of Israel and sent to the prison to have them uh, brought. But when the officers came, they did not find them in the prison, so they returned and reported. We found the prison securely locked and the guards standing at the doors, but when we opened them, we found no one inside. Okay, now I'm going to spoil a little bit of uh, a future sermon here because eventually Peter is going to get locked away into, uh, into prison and, and uh, he's, we're going to have this really cool story of an angel walking in Peter's chains fall off. They walk up to the prison door and just open it as if it isn't even locked. And Peter, this is also fantastical. Peter thinks he's having a vision. He doesn't actually realize he's being set free from prison until they get out to the courtyard where there's no more locked doors between him and freedom. And the angel disappears and Peter's standing there trying to figure out, wait a minute, is this a point where I wake up? Or am I really awake? And this has all actually happened and he escapes prison that way. We don't get all those cool details like this, but, but let's keep some things in mind. The, the jailer uh, in those days would have this onus upon him. If any of his prisoners escaped, he had to serve their sentences. He had to serve their sentences. And so they are very careful to point out, for the sake of the jailer and for the sake of everybody involved, They did not escape the prison when we went to get them because they got thrown in at night. And so the next morning they said, all right, summon those guys from the prisons. They need to stand trial before all of us very important people. They went to the prison. All the doors were still locked. All the guards were still in place. Have you seen anything? Are all the prisoners still in there? Yes, all the prisoners are still in there. Nothing has happened here except that when we open the door to the dungeon, No one was in there. I don't know why we don't tell this story more often. It's not as, it doesn't have all the cool details of Peter's story later on, but, but they get arrested, they get put into prison, and then they disappear. And, and we, we learn from them that, that, that they were met by an angel and told to go preach in the temple. And when the officials find them, they are preaching in the temple. Verse 25. I'm sorry, verse 24, I believe. Uh, Now, when the captain of the temple and the chief priests heard these words, they were greatly perplexed about them, wondering what this would come to. And someone came and told them, look, the men who you put in prison are standing in the temple and teaching the people. Then the captain with the officers went and brought them, but not by force, for they were afraid of being stoned by the people. So imagine this. You believe in God. You're a Pharisee, you're a Sadducee, you're a member of the Sanhedrin, and this incredible thing has happened at the prison where they just weren't there. Huh, what should we think about? Oh, but we found them, they're over here at the temple, and the crowd there is really liking what they are hearing from the apostles. What if it was your job to arrest them that day? Not fun, right? They already seem to have magical powers. We call it miracles, but you know what I mean. And they um, have this crowd here that you are afraid of. You're there to arrest very popular speakers, telling everyone that all the sacrifices and everything that the temple was built on is not needed now because you can have a direct relationship with God. So they asked the disciples, the apostles, to come along, please, and stand trial before the high council, please. Verse 27, And when they had brought them, they set them before the council, and the high priest questioned them, saying, We strictly charged you not to teach in this name, yet here you have filled Jerusalem with your teaching, and you intend to bring this man's blood upon us. But Peter and the apostles answered, We must obey God, rather than men. The God of our fathers raised Jesus, whom you killed by hanging him on a tree. 
God exalted him at his right hand as leader and savior to give repentance to Israel and forgiveness of sins. And we are witnesses to these things. And so is the Holy Spirit whom God has given to those who obey him. So carrying on from that first day of Pentecost, when all of these uneducated followers of Jesus stood up and preached in languages that they could not, that they didn't know. And they preached in those languages and everybody that was there for the holiday of Pentecost, the festival of Pentecost, they heard the gospel in their own language and everybody goes, how can these uneducated men do this? And as time has gone on, they have seen the boldness and they arrest John and Peter for healing the crippled guy and causing such a fuss at the temple. And one of the things that they took note of was the only thing these guys have going for them is that they were with Jesus. They're not educated otherwise. They're, Peter and John especially are just fishermen from Galilee. And uh, we come to this story and these guys who can magically, you know, Houdini out of prison and show up at the temple, and they're still not afraid. It's like, we arrested you once. Aren't you afraid yet? No, we're not. And Peter gives the reason here. We must obey God rather than men. And this is why governments don't like Christianity. Now, our government was founded with the idea of freedom. That way, they don't have to get in the way of the God who is the God of Christianity. But other governments who like a bit more control, especially the communist government, and I have, the, I have this dream because socialism and the government paying for everything is so popular right now, especially uh, with people who don't remember anything about the Cold War. And, and I want you to know that even though, um, let's see, in 1991, when the Iron Curtain fell, I was nine. So I was old enough to have some clue. And then at 16, we went to the former Soviet Union and saw a lot of the aftermath in 1998. And, and, and of course, we were going to the one European country that still has a dictatorship, all right? And that we had protests in the streets all through 2020. They've been having protests in the streets because they think that this last election was rigged. This dictator controls everything. Uh, people who oppose him in elections disappear mysteriously. Uh, journalists who uh, write bad things about him disappear mysteriously. Um, his election opponent, who everyone thinks won the election, had to flee to another country with her children. The reason she was running was because originally it was her husband that was running against him and he got arrested. And so all of this stuff is going on in Belarus. And whenever you give any government that much control, that's what you're looking at ultimately because all human beings love power, love to abuse power. Absolute power corrupts absolutely. That's the old saying. But I fear that, uh, you know, who can even remember names like Gorbachev or even Stalin? Do we know what this, so I have this dream of, you know, during the, uh, during the season of the 4th of July weekend, after a year of people trying to tear down statues, uh, not just of Confederates, but even of <laughs> Grant and Lincoln, uh, which blows my mind, uh, I have this dream that I'm probably not going to be able to execute very well because I have so many other things going on of at least the kids, you know, 20 and under of our church. We could talk about communism. We could talk about governments that control everything. We could talk about how great it is to live in a country where it's up to us what denomination we belong to, what religion we belong to, and just leave the government out of it entirely. Uh, but... They seem to think that, well, if something's good, the government should just force it on everybody, right? And that's exactly how it won in places like the Soviet Union and Venezuela and everything. Everyone agreed that this thing over here was good, so let's empower the government to force it on everybody. And it's very seductive. It's very seductive. And uh, it's, it's crazy where we are today. Um, it's crazy that we are falling for it again. So I ha and and wouldn't you know, 
the July missions emphasis with WMU and we do Children in Action, we do Youth on Mission. The missions emphasis is this country called Ukraine. So maybe we will have a chance to talk a little bit about communism and why it's bad. And what, even though human beings are so stupid that we make lots of stupid mistakes, we are better off letting human beings make their own stupid mistakes than, for, than asking the government to come in and fix everything. Uh, it's bad to let human beings make their own mistakes, and having the government come in and fix everything is even worse. Okay, So it's not a perfect world. It's just the best one that we've come up with so far. Anyways, the apostles are not intimidated by the powers that be there in Jerusalem. We strictly charge you not to teach in this name, yet here you have filled Jerusalem with your teaching, and you intend to bring this man's blood upon us. See, all they were catching from the message of the gospel was, you're saying we killed Jesus, and that we shouldn't have done that. And the message of the gospel was, yes, you killed Jesus. You rejected God. Repent. And that's all it takes. That's all it takes because we do serve a merciful God. You don't need to be upset that God is upset with you. God has a solution for the fact that he is upset with you. The solution is not for God to lighten up and suddenly decide he's not upset with you. God came up with a solution where we could never pay back to God what we have taken from him. We could never pay back God for what we have done to him. So God paid it. Would you do that for somebody? I think God's nicer than we are. Verse 33, when they heard this, they were enraged and wanted to kill them. But a Pharisee in the council named Gamaliel, a teacher of the law, held in honor by all the people, stood up and gave orders to put the men outside for a little while. And, when, and he said to them, men of Israel, take care what you are about to do with these men. Now, this is very interesting. Not often does um, someone on the other side speak for God. Uh, it's already happened once in the book of John. The evil high priest who was in charge of having Jesus crucified, because he was high priest, God still spoke through him. He didn't mean to. He didn't mean to be one of the good guys, but he said a little phrase. It's more expedient for one man to die than the whole nation. He had no idea. He was prophesying inadvertently that Jesus was the one that was going to die instead of the whole nation of Israel and the nation of God's choosing, the people of God, even us. Jesus dies instead of us. And here we have Gamaliel who makes a wise uh, judgment and we are living with the effects of it even today. He said to them, verse 35, take, uh, Men of Israel, take care what you are about to do with these men. For before these days, Theudas rose up, claiming to be somebody. And a number of men, about 400, joined him and he was killed. And all who followed him were dispersed and came to nothing. After him, Judas the Galilean rose up in the days of the census and drew away some of the people after him. He too perished and all who followed him were scattered. So in the present case, I tell you, keep away from these men and let them alone. For if this plan or this undertaking of, is of man, it will fail. Gamaliel stands up and says, now hold on here. We know about God. We know that you can't stand against God. We've had these messiahs show up before. We've had these messiahs show up before. There was that one guy. What was his name? Uh, 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 Theudas. Yeah, he had like 400 followers. And we executed him, and they all went back to their day jobs. They scattered. It came to nothing. And then there was that other guy, and he had a big following. But once, once it was put down, it was put down. So let's give this some time. Let's give this some time, and these Jesus followers will disperse too. Verse 39, but... If it is of God, you will not be able to overthrow them. Amen? Amen. I'll read that again so that you'll now that you know when to amen. All right, verse 39. <laughs> Thanks, Mom. <laughs> but if it is of God, 
you will not be able to overthrow them. Amen. All right. You might even be found opposing God. So they took his advice, and when they had called in the apostles, they beat them and charged them not to speak the name of Jesus and let them go. Then they left the presence of the council, rejoicing that they were counted worthy to suffer dishonor for the name. And every day in the temple and from house to house, they did not cease teaching and preaching Jesus as the Christ. And so they weren't afraid of these men nearly enough, in my estimation. They still felt the freedom to give them a beating. By the way, do you know why everybody in the Bible gets beat 39 times? The Romans felt that 40 lashes would kill a man. So they just took one away. <clears throat> you ever been beat within an inch of your life? I guess that's what they thought they were doing. So this was a stout warning, right? They said, listen, now, if Gamaliel had not spoken up, uh, the, the plan probably would have been to try to crucify them, get permission from the Romans, try to crucify these new leaders. I think Gamaliel was scared that that would just make more martyrs, right? That would just make more martyrs. It'll just grow. Let's leave it alone if it's of men. I love this. I absolutely love this. Someone not on the side of God says, look, if it's of men, if it's only something that human beings are doing, it'll fail on its own, people. It'll fail on its own. There's a whole different sermon in there about churches trying to do stuff on their own without inviting the Spirit of God to work. But if it's of God, we wouldn't even be able to stop it anyways. And that is the 2,000-year history of Christianity. Did, they, did the Soviet Union stomp out Christianity within the Soviet Union? Absolutely not. Did the Roman Empire stamp out Christianity? No, the Christians took over. And when the barbarians came in and Rome fell, did the barbarians stomp out Christianity? They turned into all the Christian nations of Europe that had official government-sanctioned churches. And Christianity spread like wildfire because everybody thinks that the European governments forced it on their people. Oh, no, it involved missionaries. I'm here to tell you, someone who's read at least some of the history of Christianity, missionaries went everywhere in Europe. People got converted and the pagans put up a fight. But we outlasted them. Has the Communist Party of China stamped out Christianity? Some estimates are that as much as 10% of the Chinese population in mainland communist China, as much as 10% might be meeting in secret in house churches as Christians. It's spread like crazy. Do you know where the largest church is? I wouldn't recommend you attend there. They're a prosperity gospel church. But do you know where the largest Christian church is? Seoul, South Korea. And, uh, and then you've got North Korea. Are there Christians in North Korea? Not officially, but we know better. The one city in the world that all Muslims face when they pray is the city of Mecca in Saudi Arabia. And I have read, well, here's the thing about Muslim countries is when you convert from Islam to Christianity, your religion is on your government issued identity card. Did you know that? Could you imagine if your driver's license said Baptist? Just just think about it for a minute. And you get pulled over by a cop that doesn't like Baptists, right? You get pulled over by a cop that's like, my wife goes to a Baptist church. I can't stand those people. And you get a ticket. Uh, uh, and you always will wonder if it was because you were Baptist or not. Just think about that. Just think about if Muslims had Muslim written on their driver's licenses and the cops would be like, whatever, you're going to jail. You know, we would hate that in America, but that's what a lot of these Muslim countries do. And if you convert to Christianity and you submit to the government to get your religion on your government issued ID changed, it gets lost in the mail. It gets stuck in red tape. Now, if you want to convert to Islam, that comes through like that. So then if you want to go on the Hajj and only Muslims are allowed in the holy city of Mecca and the government never came through on 
changing the religion on your ish, government issued card over to Christianity. You can be a believer in Jesus. You can go to Mecca. Oops. Anyways, we have Christians in Mecca. They can't stop us. They can't stomp us out. And sometimes, here in America, we fear that what the devil has not been able to accomplish in the rest of the world through fear and intimidation is something that he might be on the way to accomplishing here in America through apathy and comfort and, uh, and leniency. That's a lot to think about, isn't it? That's a lot to think about. Our example here is that the apostles set the example of not fearing man, not fearing the government, not even fearing arrest or beating or even death, and still proclaim Jesus. They follow the example of Jesus, who decided that even if they killed him, it was worth it. And of course, he had an ulterior motive. His sacrifice was going to pay for the sins of the world. And as you read the New Testament, you will find that the apostles and the other Christians from that early church believed that their sacrifice would be, their blood would be the water that watered the newly planted churches and that the kingdom would advance and that the name of God would be glorified. Now, I know that might be a, a heavy pill to swallow all at once, but it's definitely something I think worth thinking about. We're going to have our final song as our instrumentalists come forward. We're going to ask you to consider not just whether or not you're a Christian. Of course, that call always goes out. If you don't know Jesus or you've not turned your life over to Jesus, please come. Please, please give your, you know, even with vacation Bible school decorations everywhere. It doesn't matter what's on the stage. It doesn't matter whether we are in a church building or an outside shelter or or in the sunlight or, or whatever. You don't need a special building. You don't need a special priest. You don't need a special minister. God can hear you wherever. Come forward. Give your life to Christ. We'll walk you through that. We'll show you what that looks like. And uh, But if you already are a Christian, but you've not been living for God, we want you to rededicate your life to him. If you've given your life to Christ and haven't told the church yet, come forward. Now's an appropriate time to come and tell the church. If you want to be baptized, uh, I heard a great suggestion the other day was that uh, someone could be baptized on Celebration Sunday when we have it August 1st. That'll give us plenty of time to plan. Come forward. Uh, let the church know what you want to do. We reserve this time for any commitment that you want to make public. Come forward and give it all to God.